Good afternoon. Um, I want to welcome you to the Appropriations Committee. Uh, and this is a meeting of the full committee where uh, today I'm going to be discussing and staff will be discussing, um, you know, good news that we've received this week uh, in a couple of forms and also talk about uh, our revised uh, budget uh, schedule for uh, uh, the FY22 budget. Um, uh, some of you may have noticed already that the schedule has slid a little bit and there's a reason for it. Um, committee, this week uh, we got uh, good news. Um, good news in the form of a $900 million write-up in revenues. And let me first begin talking about those revenues. Uh, this is not a floodgate uh, for us to open up uh, and start spending um, this money. Uh, as a matter of fact, the administration, uh, I think, will probably uh, have a coming another supplemental that will spend portion of that money. The administration in uh, the last supplemental provided $100 million uh, to us to help with our capital uh, program. Uh, you may recall we started out with zero capital uh, to work with, and uh, we now, thanks to their uh, generosity have a hundred and this 900 million, I think provides us with uh, more flexibility with the capital program. Um, I, I do wanna say that what this 900 million represents is really not new, new money, new found money. It doesn't say the economy is doing better than it ever has been before. In fact, only says to us that the revenues are where we projected they would be a year ago or before the pandemic. Uh, so it's not like our economy is uh, spinning along great. It's just that the revenues came in because of all the actions that we've taken, because of the CARES Act, because of everything that we've done uh, back kind of on the mark where we hoped we would be a year ago. Uh, we have a long way to go. And I think it's really important for us to remember this. You know, the, I hear a lot of talk on the floor about, you know, the, the little guy, the blue collar worker, uh, the mom and top, uh, mom and uh, uh, pop stores. And, uh, you know, in the Baltimore area region where I'm from, you know, we know that as an example, anybody who was in tourism business or the hospitality business, our restaurants, uh, uh, these jobs have not come back online yet and these families are still struggling. And I think it's real important to remember that we're not gonna fix this like that, that this is gonna be a one, two, three year move out of not only relief, but uh, restructuring our economy in Maryland. And uh, I know that uh, this committee, uh, as well as the administration, as well as the Senate committees, working together can do it. Uh, so 900 million, we can breathe a little easier and we certainly know that we will have a capital program this year as we have in the past. The other thing that's happened this week, as a matter of fact, it's happening, I think today, is that Congress is passing the Biden Relief Act. What does that mean for Maryland? Well, I'll let Dave Romans talk a little bit about it in a few minutes, but it means $3.9 billion will come to Maryland uh, to help with both relief and recovery of uh, in the state. And part of that is that it's built in that we can use this money both in FY 22, 23, up even through in 24, which is exactly that road to recovery that I see and I think many of you see as needed at this point in time. Uh, the governor of the state of Maryland will have, I think, definite ideas about how he and his administration wants to continue to rebuild our economy. But we are the policymakers. 
We are the policymakers and we want to work in partnership with this governor as we have this term uh, uh, when it comes to the relief and recovery uh, of the state of Maryland uh, post pandemic. So we have an opportunity here uh, that is coming. And uh, I think it's uh, going to uh, very much affect uh, many uh, budget decisions. That's why we have postponed the final budget decisions from Friday to Monday and so on and so forth. Uh, we wanna give our presiding officers and the governor uh, a chance to sit down and see if there is a way to repeat the really great cooperation that we had in the Relief Act that we passed earlier this year, uh, again, with uh, the federal funds coming in. But I think it's important to note that we want to see if we can uh, at least guide uh, how we want uh, our priorities, the governor's priorities and the Senate priorities to mesh, uh, not only in our current budget that we're working on, uh, but also, uh, and future budgets. Uh, there's a couple of ways that we can do that. Uh, one, I hope that it's, uh, we all join hands again, like we did on the Relief Act. Uh, and, uh, but two, we have uh, had in this committee, it's my bill, uh, and uh, we had a hearing on it that basically says that uh, we, in this bill, outline what the governor can come in by budget amendment and spend, you know, mon monies on uh, up to certain amounts, uh, leaving uh, vast discretion for the governor. We also have a bill uh, from Senator King that has passed the Senate that does much of the same thing. It basically says that we put our imprint uh, on how we'd like to see this money spent. And let me just tell you, and I'm just going to run through a list that's very uh, uh, quick, but uh, I, I want to tell you about the kinds of things I think about when I look at this amount of money. One, we can repay the rainy day fund. We could even, even increase the rainy day fund. Two, we can make sure that our retirement plan for our state workers is we know it's solvent. We can make sure that is no way nicked or damaged by any decisions we make this year. We can replay the blueprint fund, which we have borrowed a significant amount of money from this year. We can pay for not all of, but much of the Relief Act. Uh, we can actually use this money if we want to to pay down the deficit, not just this year's deficit, next year's deficit, even the year following's deficit. There is enough money uh, coming from the federal government uh, combined with the write-up that we can do these things to make sure that Maryland's future for all of us is bright and that we act very responsibly uh, with this money so that we don't just spend it fritter here, fritter there. We actually repay our accounts, uh, uh, really solidify uh, uh, moving in the future, uh, our retirement plan, so on and so forth. Um, we can uh, continue to help essential workers. We can, and I think this is very important. I, I've heard this theme on the floor and I think it's very important. Uh, again, going back to those people who are not getting their jobs back. I think as in any time you have a slowdown, whether it's a pandemic or just the great recession of, you know, uh, 2006, seven and eight, uh, the economy comes back differently. And we know our economy is going to come back differently after this pandemic. We know that we need to be helping uh, telework more than we've ever helped before. We need to know that we need to be providing broadband and make sure that our rural counties as well as our urban counties are able to uh, you know, be online. The economy is gonna come back different. And we also know that we need 
of retraining, reemployment, and apprenticeships in a number of areas where those hospitality workers may not have a restaurant to go to when this pandemic ends. We can't count on every restaurant, every bar, every tourist attraction to open up again. So I think we have great opportunity, and I'm gonna let uh, Dave Ronemans talk about this, but I want you to know that the vision that I see that I am so hopeful for is that we work together uh, with this administration and with the Senate, just as we did with the Relief Act, uh, to put our imprint on uh, the incredible help coming from the federal government at this time. So with that, let me turn it over to David to talk a little bit more about uh, the money. And David, uh, I know that, because uh, I know some of my friends on this uh, in this committee, many of them will think of tax cuts and rebates. I want you to address that piece of it too. Okay, okay thank you. Um, I, let me just start out. So the, the um, this Biden stimulus bill has a lot of components to it. And the, the chair focused um, on the state fiscal recovery piece, which as she mentioned is close to $4 billion for the state of Maryland. That same bill has $1.9 billion for local governments in Maryland. And then there are a lot of other sort of policy targeted components. There's more than a billion dollars for the local school systems in the bill. There's substantial money being invested in testing and contact tracing and vaccines that will come to the state to help with the rollout of those things. There's money for transit. There's money for housing, for rental housing assistance. There's money for mortgage assistance. There's a lot of targeted money. Those are just some of the examples that will go, you know, there's money for childcare. So those, those pots of money are, you know, sort of targeted to those areas. And then there's this broader 3.9 billion that has has to be used to kind of respond in some way to the pandemic, whether it's the economic impact or, um, you know, restoring services that had to be cut because revenues were down or so forth. There has to be some, you know, reaction or response to the pandemic and using the, the 3.9 billion. And as the chair just referenced, there is a, a sort of a interesting tax provision related to the 3.9 billion, which says that if a state goes ahead and cuts taxes, and that includes rebates, tax credits, you know, so anything that looks like a tax cut, um, targeted or otherwise, after March the 3rd, that the value of the tax cut is deducted from the amount of federal money we get. That means they don't want their money being used for, uh, for the states to um, provide tax cuts. Um, so it's gonna make some, for some difficult decisions on any sort of tax legislation in front of the General Assembly, because it's essentially a double whammy. You lose whatever revenue you lose because you do the tax cut on the state side, and then you would lose some of the 3.9 billion. Um, so I think, I think big picture, that's what's in the, the federal bill. We do not have Maryland specific dollar allocations for all those different kind of policy area components yet. We are hoping to have that soon, and we'll certainly share that um, with you once it's available. I think the other issue for you, and the chair certainly talked about this extensively, is well, how does this money end up in the budget? So there's a couple of ways. The, I think the ideal way is that the governor submits supplemental budgets during this session, at least for fiscal 21 and 22. We actually have through calendar 24 to spend that 3.9 billion. But for at least the current year and the next year, that the governor would add money to the supplemental budget, reflecting you know, how, the, how he proposes to spend the money. And then you have just like you do with the rest of the budget, the opportunity to, you know, cut it, fence it, restrict it, you know, take whatever actions you believe are appropriate to um, target that money. Um, the alternative is that the governor could, as he did with the CARES Act, submit budget amendments, both during session and after session. And in those cases, um, really, you don't have anything more than review and comment. And in some cases, he's been using his emergency authority to just execute the budget amendment without even giving you the review and comment period. So that's where the, the chair's bill, House Bill 898 um, comes in where if there isn't sort of an agreement with the administration about, well, how do we wanna spend this money and bringing it in through supplementals, that you could pass a bill that says that the budget amendment process can't be used to add this 3.9 billion, except, and then you could delineate whatever your priorities are for the use of that money and allow 
um, budget amendments to bring money in for those uh, purposes. So um, those are really the two ways um, the money can get into the budget. Now, of course, the next session, the governor can appropriate money as well, uh, both into the fiscal 22 and 23 budgets. But big, big picture, that's sort of the issue for you in terms of trying to have some input on how this extraordinary amount of money is spent. Um, that's really all I have, uh, Chair McIntosh, but I'm happy to answer questions if there are any. Sure. Are there any questions of either Mr. Romans or me? No questions? Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Up, 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 up. Okay, now I see it. Uh, Delegate Krim. Thank you, Madam Chair. You said no questions, and I said, oh, I can find a question. So, uh, Mr. Romans, can you define infrastructure for us in the federal bill, besides it being highways? Uh, what else would be included in infrastructure as defined there? In yes, it is. There's um, out of that 3.9 billion, this, we're going to get about 160 million or so that's specifically earmarked for infrastructure. And that is fairly broadly defined. I don't have the exact definition right in front of me, but it's, it's pretty broad. And then in addition to that, the other 3.8 billion or so, um, it says it can be used for water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure. So that would, that's specifically delineated in the bill. Um, and you know, one of the difficulties with this bill is that it's, it's very, some of the provisions are very broad and the U.S. Treasury will ultimately you know, issue some guidance about how they interpret the law. Yes. So to some extent, some of the nuance here will depend on exactly what the Treasury guidance says. It may be more favorable than we think on a plain reading, or it may not be. Thank Delegate you. Delegate Beitzel. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Just a point of clarification. Uh, you, you talked about, you know, can't do any tax cuts. Uh, where we lose lose funding for whatever the amount of the tax cut would be, uh, it can just to be clear, can this be used to replace the monies that were borrowed and 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 obtained to do the relief act that we passed and with just recently in the bill that we had here in the general assembly? That's a very good question, and Mr. Romans, you want to answer that? Very good question. Sure. I mean, I think certainly the, the Relief Act had, you know, over 300 million of spending that money was taken out of the rainy day fund to support. I think all of that spending would be eligible to be supported with the, with the federal dollars, for example. Um, so I, I think there will be, we can pay for quite a bit of, quite a few of the things that we've done to respond to the pandemic with this money. And if I may, uh, Madam Chair, just a question on that. Uh, you know, one of the things that's been we've been dealing with for years is uh, the money that was borrowed for the open space program, and there's still an amount of forty some thousand. I mean, forty some million hanging out there. Could this be used to repay that? Mm -hmm. um, I think we'd have to look closely at what the wording is. I mean, I, I'm not sure. I mean, you might be able to make an argument that's pandemic related because it's if some of it goes to parks and for open space and. <laughs> You know things where we we've seen a great increase in demand in in the last year. Okay, thank you. I can and the other thing though I will further just a further further nuance is certainly what this will do uh, is uh, open up the, our ability to have more capital money. We could, mm -hmm. and that money could be used. Uh, for some repayment or certainly not to cut the payment for this year. Okay, absolutely. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're very welcome. Uh, Delegate uh, Valentino Smith. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and Mr. Romans, and thank you, Madam Chair, for outlining um, the priorities we have for the state. The one thing I think you covered, but I just wanted to emphasize, we've talked about it briefly, is that even pre-pandemic, we saw that the benefit that we're giving to the poor, especially with temporary cash assistance, SNAP, TDAP, and, and family emergency hadn't really kept pace 
pre-pandemic and post-pandemic, now that we have a tremendous number of people on those roles, we've just been using what the federal government usually directly sends down. We could, underneath your bill, add to those benefits if we saw fit to increase them. Uh, yes, we could. Is that correct, Mr. Romans? Uh, yes, I think you, you certainly could do, you know, for example, the TCA benefit was enhanced. I think you could certainly do things like that uh, with the federal and, money. And adjust the cliff and add to housing vouchers. Thank you. I think that's good news for population that we see exasperating um, need. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Delegate Solomon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Romans, I just had a quick question, not directly related necessarily to this, uh, to the stimulus plan. Okay. You know, we've talked about um, the potential hit that our counties could see from the commercial um, commercial property revenue um, tax. Uh, is there any sense from DLS of what the impact could be on COVID um, to that piece and maybe the county finances? I mean, I haven't, I'm not as focused on the county finances, but there is 1.9 billion going to local governments that should help, um, would help them and give them some flexibility. Uh, Delegate Proctor? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, Delegate Proctor had her hand up, but she's not here with me right now. Uh, so um, are there any other questions from any other members? Okay, well, I only have one other announcement. Uh, so stay tuned, be flexible. I mean, at the beginning of this week, in fact, um, uh, Delegate Proctor, did you have a question? Yeah, unmute yourself. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was wondering, is the government going to be monitoring any other uh, decisions we make? You said they would take the money back if we used it for taxes. Are they putting any other stipulations on, on how we use the money? Yeah. We Go ahead, Dave. I mean, there, there is, I mean, there's some broad guidance about what, what is allowable. And I think that once we get treasury guidance, it'll be clearer what is allowable um, uses. But generally speaking, things responding to the pandemic, including impacts on households and the economy and so forth right. are allowable. The, the big, the only place that we would, we would get penalized if for some reason they thought we spent something on something that had nothing to do with the pandemic. But the only really big prohibition in the bill is this, this tax one where they specifically say we're going to penalize you. Thank you. Okay. All right, I only have one other announcement uh, and I'm gonna embarrass her, but I want everybody to wish Michelle Lambert a happy birthday today. All right, Yay. those hands. Happy birthday, birthday. Michelle. Happy, happy birthday. birthday. And, Thanks uh, everyone. <laughs> and, it is Michelle who started out this week telling me that I had to be flexible and patient, that this is gonna be a process this year that is unlike any other process. Uh, so I'm asking you to follow her advice, okay? So be patient, we'll be in touch. And more than anything, I hope that uh, we, the administration and the Senate uh, can move forward together uh, but it's just really important to me and to everybody. I think that your input uh, is a part of uh, the uh, federal government package. So thank you. Have a great day today, everybody. Okay. <laughs>